Hey there, welcome to Big Out Books. My name is Alex and today I'll be telling you about 10 of my favorite books that I read in 2019. So a few things that I want to mention before we get going with the list. Uh, the first is that these books were not all published in 2019. I read predominantly backlist and I think this list reflects that. <laughs> and secondly, all the books on this list were books that I experienced for the first time in 2019. So I don't allow rereads to make my year end best list probably because it would just continue to be Hamlet at the top of my list every year and that would get a bit boring. So we're going to move on with our lives and just focus on things that were new to me this year. So I guess let's get started. All right, so I feel like I have to warn you that this list just got messy almost immediately because when I sat down to film this, I had chosen Master of Reality by John Darnielle as book number 10 on my list. But then I noticed this bookshelf behind me and Milkman by Anna Burns really jumped out at me. And I had this crisis of conscience where I felt like this book deserved to be on the list more than this book. So I feel like it's not really appropriate to just start changing my list in the moment as I'm filming, but it's also my list and my rules. So I guess I'm going to go with this gut change. So uh, we will take off Master of Reality <laughs> in favor of Milkman. Now this is a book that has already received a lot of praise and recognition, especially after winning the Man Booker Prize. But I really only picked this book up because of obligation. Like I didn't really think that I was going to like it. I was kind of begrudging about the whole experience and this thing won me over instantly, like right away on page one, I was all on board. And the reason why I was so captivated with this book was because the main character is just a girl who wants to read her classic novels while she walks down the streets and not be troubled or harassed by creepy men in their trucks following her. So <laughs> that's just such a relatable story. Even though I myself have not grown up in Ireland during the Troubles, I can't relate to her on that kind of social political front. But still, I was really invested in her struggle and in her story. So I feel like this book had a lot to teach me about the situation in Ireland and what it's like to grow up in this headspace where every decision and every interaction becomes so political and how, what that does to your mind and your soul as you're growing up in this kind of environment. I feel like this book really powerfully captured that and used writing in a creative way to really sweep you away in what those feelings were like. So <laughs> even though it's a last minute addition to my list, I really do feel like Milkman deserves a spot because it was an incredible read. Next up on the list, I have a short story collection and that is Stories of Your Life and Other Stories by Ted Chiang. These stories just blew me away because they were so inventive and so engrossing. And I think it's a testament to the strength of Ted Chiang's writing that so many of his stories have to do with mathematical or scientific concepts, which are usually things that I do not enjoy <laughs> engaging with. And yet the way that he explains things is pretty straightforward and he has such compelling characters at the heart of his stories that even though they are these kind of like cold scientific ideas, he makes you understand the importance of them and how it plays out in the lives of these characters in a way that I thought was really engaging. In particular, there were three stories that really stood out for me in this collection, one of them being Understand, which was about this epic battle going on between these two super smart advanced human beings and how they we're trying to take each other out. Uh, the second one being Story of Your Life, the titular story that also served as the inspiration for the film Arrival. I really enjoy both the film and the story, even though they are quite different. They both do such a brilliant job of conveying the story of a linguistics professor who has been hired to communicate with non-human alien life forms, but you also learn her personal story and some of the things that she has learned from these aliens. So that was a really emotional story. And finally, there's Hell is the Absence of God, which is just one of the most evil short stories I've ever read before. So leading up to that story, I thought that Ted Chiang was quite empathetic and sensitive towards his characters. And then he dropped this story and I just connected with him so much more after seeing this really dark, evil and cruel part of his imagination. So those three were my standout stories, but overall, this was just an excellent collection. I think Chang is a master of the form, and I'm so excited that he dropped a new collection of short stories out in 2019. So I will have to catch up with that one in the coming year. 
Next up is a book that I finished quite recently near the end of December and that is The Ice Shirt by William T. Volman. This is the first book in his Seven Dream series which deals with different catastrophic collisions between European people discovering North America and the indigenous peoples who already live there and how there's this kind of clash between cultures. Now I had been highly anticipating starting this series for a few years but the reason why it took me so long to finally pick up this book was because I knew that this was going to be about Vikings and Norse culture so I really wanted to get more educated about that topic before going into this book. So here is all the pre-reading that I did before starting this book. I checked out both the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda last year which are two extremely important texts towards understanding Norse mythology. And then this year I worked my way through the sagas of the Icelanders so that I could get a sense of what the sagas were, who these people were, how they told stories, and they ended up all being pretty relevant to be able to understand the ice shirt. So there had been a lot of build up to this book and it really didn't disappoint me. Though there's lots of Norse myth and history in this novel, it particularly is expanding upon the saga of the Greenlanders, where a group of people cross the Atlantic Ocean and try to start a settlement in a place called Vinland on the east coast of North America and of course the settlement is doomed and things don't go very well. What's impressive about this book is that William Volman really knows his sources and if you go to the back you can see that he really knows these sagas, these legends, the history, he goes to the places himself but yet he uses so much of his imagination to inform what he thinks the character motivations might have been in these stories. So if you read the original sagas themselves it's mostly just a record of what happens but you don't really get to to understand the people themselves, but Volman takes full artistic license as he tries to imagine what was going on in the minds of these characters and the story that he comes up with is just bananas. Like this book is very bizarre but it's impossible to put down. It's very engaging. But I also like how William Volman tries to engage with the perspective of indigenous peoples as well. He includes some Inuit legends and he goes to modern day Greenland to talk to some indigenous people. So even though there isn't the same kind of historical record like there is from the more Western perspective, he still is trying to explore both of these cultures and the way that they collided together. So this was just a fascinating book, so imaginative, so much fun to read, and I cannot wait to see where this series is going to go next. Next up I have two 2019 new releases. Though these books were both published this year, they're both incredibly different from each other. So let's start off with the more traditional of the two and that is Deep River by Carl Merlantes. So this is a book that is just a really traditional like well done family saga kind of story. I saw someone describe it on Goodreads as boomer dad fiction <laughs> and they were kind of using that as a slight to say that it was boring and old-fashioned so I guess I might be a boomer dad but I really enjoyed this book even though it's not very flashy and it doesn't do anything very exciting or experimental it's just damn good storytelling. So this is a book that follows a family who lives in Finland but have to flee the country during the years of Russian occupation because one of the daughters has a lot of socialist values and she's been getting in trouble politically so the family moves to America, starts afresh, they move to Washington state and they get involved with the logging industry and it's just a beautiful story of how this family has to adjust to this new country, this new culture, and the daughter of course still retains her socialist beliefs and she gets involved with trying to create unions for the loggers. This novel shows you how dangerous logging was and how these workers really needed to be fighting for their rights even though that was a very difficult process at the time. So part of the reason I really loved this book was this main character I know. You just really felt for her struggles. Like I just really cared for her as a person and I just felt genuinely bad every time that she had this kind of moral dilemma in front of her where she had to make a difficult decision. You know, as a woman at the time she was expected to put her husband's career and her family first, but yet she wanted to stay true to her own beliefs and her political values and to make a difference in the world. So it was really fascinating following her struggle. The second reason why I strongly connected with this text was because I myself come from a Finnish background and there's just so much Finnish culture lovingly steeped into the pages of this text. So it was just a really warm reading experience for me in that way. I just loved seeing the references to Sisu and the Kalevala 
and I just loved recognizing that part of my heritage in this text. So overall, Deep River was one of my most enjoyable reading experiences this year. I just couldn't wait to get back to this book to find out what was going to happen to these characters. I was very invested in the story, and even though it's not the flashiest book on this list, it was one that was just deeply pleasurable and satisfying for me as a reader. The other 2019 release on my list is Black Leopard Red Wolf by Marlon James. So whereas Deep River by Carl Marlantes is kind of chill and traditional, Black Leopard Red Wolf is kind of the opposite. It's explosive and dynamic and fantastical. Marlon James is trying to reinvent the world of epic fantasy. So his world is kind of based on Africa, where you can recognize that he's done a lot of research with African myth and legend and history and cultural practices, but you can see how he twists up all of those influences to create a brand new fantastical world that is truly his own. So I think that was my favorite aspect of this story, is just how imaginative it is. The scope of this world was just really intriguing. And this is only book one of a trilogy, so we are only going to be getting to see more of this world, and I can't wait for that. The first book in this trilogy has also really intrigued my interest for what the rest of the books are going to look like, because Marlon James has claimed that he's going to be retelling the same story from three different perspectives, which usually I would say is a disastrous move, but I have so much faith in Marlon James's abilities and how he's going to twist our perspectives. What we think that we know is true in this first book is probably going to be flipped on its head in the later books. So I guess that this book is partly on my list because of the promise of how great I think this trilogy is going to work together as a whole, but it's also a satisfying reading experience on its own. I had so much fun going through this story, meeting these new characters, seeing where the story was going to go. And also this book hit me on a deeply emotional level. There are a lot of books that are still to come yet on this list that made me cry, but I'm not sure if any of them made me cry quite as hard as this one did. So that's another factor for a truly great read in my opinion. All right, so now we are moving into the top half of the list. And book number five on this list, I feel like has no business being this high on this list. It was really far from being a perfect book, but it's kind of like the culmination of a larger series. So I just had to include it somewhere. And this was kind of just where it fit in. So that is book six of the My Struggle series by Carl Uwe Nosgaard, who's a Norwegian author. This book is so long that it actually took two translators to get through it. It was translated by Martin Aitken and Don Bartlett. And uh, this is about 1,153 pages. And keep in mind, this is book six of a series. So really, I have spent the last few years of my life <laughs> working my way through the My Struggles series. A lot of people hate these books, and that's probably for good reason. I mean, this has to be the most self-indulgent literary project of the 21st century, where you have this guy that is just writing about his day-to-day -day struggles in minute detail over the course of six lengthy books. I mean, it is really self-indulgent, but yet book six did convince me that there is a larger importance and significance to this project that made it all feel worthwhile, which was really what I was hoping for out of book six. The reason why these books created a lot of controversy when they first started appearing is because Nausgaard is sharing a lot of his very unfiltered thoughts and his raw emotions. He's writing about real people, and in most cases he's using their real names, and he's sharing this very deeply personal and often unpleasant side of himself and his interactions with the people in his life. In the first book in particular, he's reflecting on his relationship with his alcoholic father. And when the book first came out, Nesgard was actually getting sued by his father's side of the family, who did not want him airing their dirty laundry in public. And that's kind of where we start with book six. It's kind of assessing the whole emotional toll of writing the series and how it's affected him personally and how it's basically ruined his relationship with a lot of his family members and just the toll that 
that this has taken for him to write these books, uh, you really realize that it has had a high cost. I found this book really interesting as a reader because usually we don't get to see this side of writers or creators. We don't usually get to see how their work impacts them in their day to day, um, the different fears and anxieties that they have about their work, and what it's like to be living near this kind of creative person where all of your experiences are just kind of mined as raw material to be used in this person's book, how it's kind of predatory and how that can really ruin a relationship. So it's just a really fascinating read. But also in this book, Nausgaard is a bit of a self-saboteur because he really includes way more material than he needs to in this book. Um, particularly, this one is notorious for containing this 400-page essay in the middle that relates to Hitler, the Holocaust, the Second World War, and this particularly overly long analysis of a poem. <laughs> so there's a lot of material in here that feels very jarring for the reader because you've just been reading all these juicy details about his dramatic personal life and then you just get thrown back into the Holocaust and you're like, why is this happening? But he does manage to tie it together in a convincing way. Even though it's still too much, it's overindulgent, but he is really trying to connect what he's trying to do with this project. This project is not supposed to be this narcissistic look just at this one man's life and the importance of it, but rather he uses his life as a way to reflect on society at large. I think that I'm definitely oversimplifying the message and you know there's no way for me to sit here in a few minutes and totally summarize what this massive six volume series of books sets out to do, but the reason why it's been valuable for me personally personally is that it's made me re-examine my relationship with my own society and how an individual kind of needs to belong on one side but also needs to remain separate and to always maintain your independence of thought because it can be really dangerous to just go along with what everyone else is thinking. Even if that has kind of great costs to you personally, you kind of have to live by your own values. So there were a lot of interesting ideas in this book. Even though it has some truly painful monotonous moments, I think overall this project was totally worthwhile so I'm glad that I read it and I know that it has kind of changed me as a reader and a thinker so it had to appear somewhere on this list. Moving on to number four we have The Mandarins by Simone de Beauvoir. This was translated from the French by Leonard Friedman and three out of my top four books of the year were translated French classics so make of that what you will. <laughs> now this is a book that really took me a while to get immersed in the story. So the book itself is around 730 pages pages but it wasn't until I was at least like 250 pages into this thing before I was even sure that I liked the story so it was a bit of a slow start but once I was in like I was really in and I was quite committed and fascinated with what was going on in this novel. So this novel is pretty famous for being quite autobiographical in a lot of the parts. Um, since this is a depiction of the French intellectual scene following World War II. So what it was like to be in Paris as these intellectuals were trying to focus on how to best rebuild society after such a catastrophic war. So part of this book is intensely political as it deals with these different characters grappling with what they think is the right thing to do. In particular, many of the characters in this book belong to the Communist Party. They think that capitalism has led to these wars and has kind of destroyed society. And they think that the only way forward for a more equitable and just society will be communism. However, this is also during the time period when Soviet Russia is happening and stories are starting to leak out of Stalin's Soviet Russia and they're kind of these disturbing stories about some of the crimes that are going on in the country and characters in here aren't really sure whether to believe what they're hearing and if they do believe what they're hearing, how does that affect their moral decision? Can they still support the party? What's more important? So what I really liked about this book was seeing how history is so confusing as it's unfolding in the present day. Because for us reading today, with hindsight, it seems very clear what these characters should do and how they should feel. But when it's happening in the moment, it can be so confusing, especially if you're an intellectual person and you really pride yourself on making the right decision and trying to use your influence to make society a better place. Fascinating political stuff going on in this book, as well as some really juicy personal drama. There's a love story in here um, that is kind of based on the real story that went on between Simone 
Simone de Beauvoir and the writer Nelson Algren, who was based in the United States. And Simone obviously lived in France, and they got involved in this transatlantic love affair that was basically doomed to fail from the start because neither of them were really willing to give up their lives or their positions to be together. And those parts of the book were just so like tender and so devastating. So that also really upped the emotional appeal of this book. So overall, this was just like a deeply satisfying read. It's fascinating as a portrayal of the time, but also is a really engaging love story. So I think it's got a little bit of everything. So even though I had a rough start with this one, I ended up truly loving it by the end. For my number three pick, I'm going to be talking about a series that I've only recently finished reading. So I'm still kind of working on processing my thoughts and my feelings, but it was truly one of my most epic reading experiences this year. And that's why it's so high up on this list. And and that is the complete Sandman series by Neil Gaiman. So these are volumes 1 through 10, but I did also get to this 11th volume, which was a later addition to the series. I'm just going to hold this one up because it's a lot less heavy. So the Sandman series is kind of a classic now in the graphic canon. It's one of the most well-known and highly recognized works in the comics genre, and I can see why. Like, this thing is truly epic in scope because it's not really just taking this like superhero character and just watching them try to like solve crimes and stuff but rather Gaiman has like really invented his own mythology and his own way that the universe works <laughs> and he's created so many characters and stories with the series like it was truly remarkable to behold. So basically he has invented this family of beings called the Endless and they're not to be mistaken with gods even though they are highly powerful because gods rely on people who are going to believe in them. That's where their power comes from. The Endless exists in a power structure that's kind of beyond all of that. They don't really care if you believe in them or not. They don't really need you, but you as a human need them because they control all of these important aspects of our lives. So there are different members of the family that control different realms, such as death, dream, destiny, destruction, desire, despair, and delirium. I think I got all of them. But as the series explores, these characters themselves have kind of changed and warped over time, which causes a lot of real world implications for the people living on Earth. So ultimately, that's what I found most impressive about this series, is that it is so large in scale, and it's asking these huge cosmic philosophical questions. So even though it's told through this really engaging medium of comics and the stories themselves are so entertaining, yet at the end of the day the series really makes the reader question a lot of what they believe about their life and their death and the purpose of it all. So that made for just such a mind-blowingly cool read. I think this series works really well because there's a good balance where most of the story has to kind of restrain itself by focusing around Morpheus, who is the Sandman and the Lord of the Realm of Dream. Most of our stories concern him as a character and we get to watch his arc throughout the 10 issues of the series and how he kind of is slowly changing and how it kind of causes him to question his role and responsibilities as a ruler. So in some ways it focuses our story to be following the journey of this one character Character. But also I think that there's a nice freedom to this series where at least three out of the ten volumes were short story collections where you would kind of step back from the main narrative that had been building and you just follow the adventures of these different side characters. And that allowed Gaiman to show you a different part of history or a different location in the world and how that relates to the vision of Dream that he's been building in this. So I liked that there are so many kind of side plots and like these weird adventures and just a wonderful wealth of characters that we had to explore by the end of this series. So I liked that it had this one focus plot, but it wasn't afraid to meander and to show you all the cool parts of this world. So this series really just lit my imagination on fire. It was just so much fun to read, but it was also, you know, so deep and I had quite an intense emotional response to this series as well. So overall, I had just a great time reading these comics. For the most part, the art was stunning. Like you can really take your time getting lost in these illustrations, but the plots were engaging and propulsive. The characters were memorable. Really, I can see why this is a classic of the genre. Definitely one of the best graphic series I have ever followed before and such a rewarding read. 
And finally, to top off my list, I have two 19th century French classics that I loved a whole lot this year. One of them was Cousin Bette by Honoré de Balzac, and one was, of course, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. So I kind of want to pull a sleazy move like the judges for the Man Booker Prize did this year, where I just say that they were both my favorite read of 2019. And the reason why I want to do that is because I feel like they're just such different books that appeal to different sensibilities that I have as a reader and as a person, you know, where I feel like Cousin Bet is just like the fun, scandalous, sensational revenge tale. It's all about the darker impulses and like the evil side of humanity, which is just a whole lot of fun to read about. Whereas Les Miserables is kind of the opposite. It's kind of about like the good impulses that we have as human beings and how we want to do better and improve our society and become truly good, worthy, honorable people. So, you know, this is more of like your super ego and this one is kind of your id so it feels kind of unfair ranking them against each other although I guess if you want to be technical about it this would be my top read of the year for sure because Les Miserables is just like so long and it's such an experience to work your way through but still I really like how reading these books in combination can each kind of like teach you something different about human nature so that's why I kind of have to pair them together I feel like I've already talked about these books quite a lot on my channel already this year but I guess I will say why they have remained my most memorable reads of the year. For Cousin Bet, it's definitely because I have never had this much fun reading a classic. Everything about this book is so over the top and the characters are so dramatic and extra, but it just made me love it more. Like, it's not realistic fiction, but it is a damn good story. And I think that I only appreciated this book more after reading a biography of Balzac and he was kind of like a weird guy too that was pretty intense. So I think I can see some of his character <laughs> reflected in this wild read. So overall this book was just so ridiculous and juicy and exciting and it's probably the most fun I have ever had reading a classic before. So on the other side <laughs> we have Les Miserables which is kind of the opposite because this book is not really that much of a fun experience, right? This book is so long and it's a lot of hard work to get through it because you know there's a lot of history in here. Victor Hugo is not a great editor of his own work. He just throws in a lot of his ideas about social philosophy and all of those kind of things. So this book is quite a chore at times. And if you had told me after I had read the Battle of Wellington scene that this would be my favorite read of the year, I would have thought you were crazy because I really did not enjoy slogging through that section of the book. So that's what I think speaks to how incredible it is that at the end of it all, you're able to forgive the book for its many, many sins <laughs> and instead focus on what's important. Although by the end of the book, I even learned to love those sloggy sections and like the sewer section in particular was a real highlight for me. <laughs> so it's almost like you get Stockholm syndrome in this book and you just learn to like live with Victor Hugo and just deal with what he's gonna put you through. So even though this book really tested my patience, Finishing this book was just so rewarding and I feel like it really helped me grow as a reader. So even though we had our rough moments, really the benefits and like the inspiration that I drew from this book made it a totally worthwhile read one of my all-time favorites. And as I've mentioned before, I think there's gonna be something that's so special about experiencing this story for the first time. So this was just a fantastic book that made for a remarkable reading experience, and that's why it is here at the top of my list as my favorite read of 2019. So we've finally reached the end of my top 10 list for my favorite books that I read in 2019. When I started off this video, as you can probably tell, I was like very unsure about my list. I didn't know where I was gonna go <laughs> with this video but now that I'm here at the end I feel very confident about the list that I've created. This is a really wonderful stack of books and I had so many great reading experiences reading these books this year. So that's it from me today. Um, I would love to hear from you if you had any particular standouts this year. If there's anything that you think I should add to my 2020 TBR please let me know. I'd love to hear what your favorites were. So thanks so much for watching. Happy New Year and I will see you again soon.